So the first speaker in our lineup today will be uh, Professor Lars Valentin. He is from Sweden, from the Uppsala University. He is cardiologist, as far as I know. This is pretty interesting because I will also give at the end a brief introduction about our activities. So we have a good connection point here. And he will talk about how um, cardiology data can be improved by use of registry and existing biobank data. So the stage is yours and welcome Lars Valentin. Thank you. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And I uh, seem to be the only representative from the Scandinavian countries. So let me tell you anyway, how we have started to use uh, and generate big data. So this is where I am working. I am, um, is this a pointer somewhere? No, no, M maybe not. Okay, I, I am working uh, close to Stockholm in Uppsala, where we have a center to uh, re uh, run registries. So we, have so we are developing software platforms. We are uh, really in contact with every hospital around Sweden, as you can see, all the red dots uh, around 75 providing acute cardiac care. We also collaborate uh, globally with uh, leading cardiology centers in clinical trials, trying to generate evidence for new medications and new devices, and also closely connected to uh, the hospital facilities and the basic science facilities in Uppsala trying to develop new knowledge around biomarkers and genetics. So since we started this, which now is around 20 years ago, we had a concept that we need to continuously observe what's happening in healthcare, and we can only do that if we measure, and we started registries where we are entering items, not text, we are entering specific items, and we are continuously trying to evaluate the shortcomings we have in providing care, and if there are uh, shortcomings, we try to improve care by quality development programs or generate new knowledge in clinical trials and start to evaluate new diagnostic methods, etc. And this is a circle we have used. And we are using national quality registries. And those registries, they <coughs> contain patient characteristics, disease characteristics, comorbidities, and treatment. So we have in the cardiology registries around 500 items that are entered continuously during the care process. And then we obtain outcomes by merging these data with other registries that we have had in Sweden for 50 to 100 years. So we are merging data with the population registry on <coughs> survival. We have the hospital admission registry, so we can track every single patient for life concerning new admissions for any disease. We have electronic healthcare records where we can get additional information on the diseases and also on outpatient visits. We have a prescription registry where we get all the medications that are prescribed to the patients. And therefore, based on this Swedish system with unique personal numbers, we can really track a patient from the first admission until death. So, and this is of course partly also analyzed in the Swedish public statistics. And we are now, since a couple of years, also adding biobank data, accumulating plasma and <coughs> genetic samples to connect to this registry. So, I mean, it's fairly easy. So. Uh, the caregiver is entering data, itemized data, not text, in specific boxes, as you can see. Uh, and the patient can also enter data to some of the registries. We get some data from electronic patient records. Everything goes into a central server. The key of the system, why people fill in those data, it is that they get immediate feedback on their st standards of care just by pushing a button at any time when you like to have the results, you can get them. And then usually on a yearly basis, we merge 
those data with other registries and of course can use it as a research database in outcome research. So in cardiology we have uh, these, as you can see, eight registries. Uh, the top one, the CCU registries on acute myocardial infarction. We have the PCI registry on catheter procedures and stenting. We have the valve procedures. We have heart surgery. And as you can see, we cover every single patient entering Swedish hospitals, any Swedish hospital, the year around, and we don't lose a single patient. We also have other registries more recently started, secondary prevention, cardiogenetics, etc., CT. These are not complete as yet. And we have had an objective, and it is really to support development and implementation of evidence-based treatment in coronary artery disease and catheter-based and surgical intervention. So this is the primary target. It is not research. It is really to support healthcare, and we do that by monitoring uh, the patients that are entering investigations, treatments, adherence to guidelines, and relations to outcome. So this is, this is the primary objective, not research. And we provide then reports. So you can just see an example on how data are entered. They are entered online over the internet. And we also have an, an auto population of certain fields that gets from previous registrations and other registries. And we have some calculated variables. And there is also an immediate feedback about the details you have provided. This is for a coronary procedure where you get the detailed information on which type of coronary disease you have. And it's specific questions are asked. If you have not filled in some data, the system will ask you about that. We generate also feedback immediately to the staff concerning their performances in comparison to our standards and other hospitals. We are providing feedback online to the business developer. Whenever you like to have it, you will have it. You can compare certain quality criteria, which we have agreed on. Compare yourself to the best hospitals. You can look at development over time. You get this graphically presented in whatever type you like. We also provide information from the system to the individual patient, so he can compare his care to other patients' care and to see that he got the treatment that was expected. And we also provide information to the public, to politicians, so the system generates reports and every hospital is openly reported, so therefore you can compare openly the performances of every single hospital, which is a very important part of the system. Just imagine, here you can see Sweden, and you can see that there are or there were differences in mortality between the <laughs> different counties and hospitals. And we look into the statistical evaluation with confidence intervals. We can adjust for differences in patient mix and still show the differences in treatment. And we could investigate why does this happen. We, we, we like the differences because that's kind of a learning tool for us, how we can further improve and look into which are the possible reasons for the differences. And we have developed a quality, quality index <laughs> more than 10 years ago now. So we had the evidence-based care, the international and national guidelines, and you get certain points if you treated 80% of your patients according to the guidelines, or 85, and then we can get certain grades for each hospital. And we are presenting these grades openly. This is every single hospital from this year, the best one, to the wor <coughs> worst one with the lowest score. This is openly presented, goes into the Swedish newspaper every year, and you can see over time how, this, how useful this has been because you can really show that the hospitals are substantially improving concerning uh, the important procedures we have been focusing on. So now in 2014, we need to develop a new quality index because in relation to these qualities, it seems that everybody is performing now pretty well. Almost everybody above the standards of 2005, 10 years earlier. 
uh, when we started this system and looking at the median grade the hospitals had, you can see that when we openly presented the data, there was a substantial improvement, especially in hospitals that were below the average earlier. So it seems that this shaming factor was very important. The open presentation of the data to the public changed the standards of care. This is just to monitor uh, the, uh, the development of certain treatments over time. This is over 20 years, two year periods. You can see that there is a dramatic change in the treatment that we are monitoring, especially the red and orange ones. These are interventional catheter-based procedures uh, where you open up a closed coronary artery in acute myocardial infarction, uh, which over five to seven years really changed the whole healthcare system in Europe and not least in Sweden. There was kind of a decentralization of invasive procedure from seven up to 30 hospitals and every patient could be provided with this type of care. And of course, people also asked us, did this really change outcomes? And we, we have investigated this and you can see to the left the changes in mortality, which is the red line, uh, the, the, the black line at the top and the changes in the new myocardial infarction coming back for a new MI, the red line, substantially improving. And we have analyzed this using kind of big data approaches where you can, can compare two year periods. To the, uh, to the right, you see the latest years. And the difference between the colors is that the blue and orange are the more or less crude data. The gray bar is when we have adjusted for differences in patient characteristics and the yellow is when we have adjusted for new treatments. And uh, the uh, implementation of new treatments have explained around half of the reduction in mortality and reinfarction that we see. So we can really have scientific support that the use of new treatments have substantially improved outcomes. This is when you can monitor the changes over the years. So this is really 20 years outcomes that we now have in Sweden for whole populations of certain diseases like myocardial infarction. And you can see the red ones are the first years, 1995. The green are the last years, 2013-14. And <coughs> this is mortality. And you can see that if you enter the hospital now, <coughs> 20 years later, you have a substantially better survival than you had 20 years ago. And this benefit in survival, it stays over time and there's substantially less risk to come back with a new MI uh, during the, uh, to the right in the green line. So therefore, there is uh, evidence for a su substantial benefit and ho around half of that caused by new treatments. We have also compared the Swedish system with the UK system because we have a similar system in the UK. And it, we were able to show that if you enter a Swedish hospital, you have a considerably better outcome with MI than in UK. And the reason for this was, you can see to the right, that early on the difference was larger, later the difference was less. And there was a slower implementation of the new catheter-based treatments in the UK than in Sweden. So uh, a slower implementation of new treatments is partly cause of this. Another cause that we showed and published was also a larger variability between hospital treatments in the UK than in Sweden. Maybe part of our monitoring system where we knew exactly what the different hospitals were doing. We are also participating in randomized clinical trials. This is just a trial showing that one treatment, Ticagalor, is better than another clopidogrel. You can also monitor then the implementation of the new treatments. If we have make a decision in the healthcare system that we should change, see the green line, which is a new treatment coming in 2011, dramatically over only one year, switching to the use of the new treatment in comparison to the other. And we have also used that to show that the event rates are further reduced by the implementation of just this treatment in real life. One way that you also need 
One tool that you also need in the system, it is to perform a randomized trial. Even if you look back, we have hard to really provide hard evidence that some new treatments are better than others, especially if you don't have a sponsoring pharmaceutical company. So we have started to randomize in the registries. So then we approach every hospital in the registry. We get an agreement that we have an open question that needs to be resolved. And if you have an open question, you know you need to randomize. You can't just look backwards because there are so many biases. So we are trying now to combine the advantages of a registry and a randomized study. And we see, see this as a complementary tool to what the pharmaceutical companies are doing. Yeah, that's uh, my timer so it tells me that I should stop now. I will soon stop. <laughs> and what, you can, what we are doing it is that we are randomizing 60% of patients entering the system. In a sponsored trial, usually 5% are entered. We are randomizing almost everybody. We have a complete follow-up through the registries because we know everybody's personal number. We don't lose a single patient. We can show with this type of treatment that there are unnecessary procedures. People believed in this and there was a lot of such procedures. You can see them over time rapidly increasing until around 2011 when we performed the trial. 2013 we had the results and 2014 almost none used this treatment anymore. And we have other similar examples and I will skip those because of time issues. What's the reason for the success of this Registries. I think it is because it's initiated by the champions, by the physicians, the opinion leaders. The users get important information from the system. They like the system. They need it for their own purposes, not for us publishing data, but they need to improve the care in their own center. They have immediate benefit, online reports. They can have open comparisons with other hospitals, and every hospital is part of the same system. And we have also had the large success of the randomized trials because there are so many questions that are unanswered in <coughs> healthcare, and we can now provide answers to these open issues based on randomization within the registries. So thank you very much. compare the parameters that the hospitals had in quality testing versus outcome? Yeah, well, we, are, uh, we are comparing uh, the electronic patient records versus the data in our registry, and, and we have around 95% filled in and correct data. So we have 5% with either missing data or, uh, or incorrect data in the registry. Um, so, so the but was that what you asked or no because you showed data on one hand where you showed the survival per was yeah. that province or hospital and on the other hand you showed the quality so say the structural quality data based on your scores and so i was just wondering do they correlate uh, yeah the scores <laughs> there i mean we, you cannot compare individual scores but you can compare if you compare the third of hospitals with the highest score they have better outcome than those with the worst scores, yes. No, 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 sorry for not understanding. I have a question about the, the benchmarks of the hospital. How did they react? Uh, I'm thinking uh, uh, about the one that are below average, where you challenge about your <laughs> methodologies and your standardization, and how, how did you face those uh, reactions? Uh, it's, a, it's a process of uh, maturation, because when we started this 2007, when we started the registries in uh, 2000, uh, 2001, there was an agreement that we should never expose the data publicly. So that was the first agreement. But then, in accordance with Swedish law, if you have public data, anyone can ask for those data. 
So therefore, the journalist approached us, and first we said no, but then we had to expose the data on an individual basis. So we decided among ourselves, okay, let's expose them. And, and, and that was extremely helpful. But the first years we had a problem because the birth centers, they always said the data are wrong. <coughs> or, and, uh, or that they did not, they haven't, hadn't filled in complete data or that they entered the wrong patients. But our argument was, look, this is a professional <coughs> enterprise you have. I mean, look into your data. If you have filled in the wrong data, please fill in the correct data. If you have incomplete data, please do as the others. Look into, the, there is a signal here that something is not working well in your system. And, and don't look at this as a grading, look at it as a tool. And, and also, because we, we are now publicly presenting data concerning 100 different disease areas. So even the public, they have now learned in Sweden that we always have these differences in care <coughs> providing. I mean, we have large differences in cancer care nowadays, which are very much discussed. We are using different treatments in different centers. You are also in your country, but you don't know it. So we opened up this knowledge that we have differences in care, we have differences in outcome, and these are not surprisingly connected. And there are many reasons, and this is a tool. And, and I think the standards of care are improving. Yeah, but this is a good point. Thank you very much, um, Professor Valentin, because we are running a little bit out of time. But the key message is open data is important. Uh, what you can't uh, measure you can't improve, right? So it's, it's a very good statement. Thank you very much. And it brings us also to our next speaker of the afternoon. Um, we, we just heard about cancer care, so we are switching now to a different field, which is um, how to improve cancer treatment. Um, we are now turning to Moritz Gerschung. He is working at the EMBL EBI. He is a um, software engineer by training, I believe. So he is working in the bioinformatician department, and he will share how to improve the um, precision oncology vision from a practical perspective. Thank you very much, and the stage 